Uh, welcome uh, once again to uh, our nightly presentations. And uh, this is uh, Samuel Bafos. This is uh, Gospel Sounders rekindling our reformation. And uh, we are just glad the Lord has given us uh, another opportunity to be alive so that uh, we may be able to share in uh, his word. And so I'd like us to uh, pray and then be able to share what uh, the Lord has provided for us. We are looking at the gift of salvation. Shall we bow for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for the nice weather. Thank you for the gift of life and thank you for the pardon of sin. I do pray that uh, you, may, you may take control of uh, everything, the equipment, my lips, so that uh, through this uh, mortal being, you may speak to us and help me speak only the words of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. And so uh, the greatest question that uh, man may be has ever faced is uh, the question in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 19, verses uh, 16. And uh, it is something that we ask ourselves every now and then. And so like this man who came to Jesus and asked this question in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, where we are told, and uh, behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And uh, I believe that this question was uh, a question that was genuine in itself and needed a genuine answer. It's not just that everyone that came to Jesus Christ came to taste, tempt, and uh, have a quarrel with him. But this man came unto Jesus and asked him, Good master, what is this good thing that I must do that I may have eternal life? It is interesting to look at uh, the answer of Jesus Christ in uh, Matthew chapter 9, 19, verse 17. And he said unto him, why callest, thou, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And so... The man asked, what shall I do to have eternal life? And Jesus Christ is telling him that, uh, uh, why even call me good? Because it is only God who is good. So if anyone will be called good, then it means that he have to meet the standards of God. And so Christ says that only God is good. Did it mean that Christ was not good? No. but um, what Christ meant is that this man may be able to realize that in Christ was the fullness of the righteousness of God, because it is only God who is righteous. And so if we will enter into heaven, then we must be as good as God is. But then can it be possible that man can be good as God is good? The ruler had addressed Christ merely as an honored rabbi, not discerning in him his sonship of God, uh, uh, he, him being uh, the son of God, I mean. And so the Savior asked him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. On what ground do you call me good? What has made you realize that I'm good? God is the one who is good. But if you recognize me as such, you must receive me as his son and representative, meaning that the only, the only person that the goodness of God dwells in is Christ. And if thou will come to the kingdom, yes, do the commandments, but uh, can a people who are accustomed to evil do anything good? And that is where the question of Jesus Christ comes from, that... Uh, uh, unless we recognize him as the representative of God in whom all blessings flow through, then we cannot attain to the goodness of God which is required for anyone to be saved. And so it is only Christ enshrined in the heart 
that the goodness of God will be reproduced. In fact, uh, in the book of um, in the book of Romans chapter three verses uh, twenty five. Romans Romans chapter three verses twenty five. We are told that through this Jesus Christ. In fact, starting from verses twenty three. Romans 3.23, we are told, for all have seen and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So all who have fallen short of the glory of God can only be justified freely. What can I do to be saved? What shall I do to be saved? We are told this justification is freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So there is none good, only God is good. And what must I do to have eternal life? Christ tells this ruler, obey the commandments. Yet man in his finite nature cannot be able to fulfill the demands of an infinite law. Think about that for a moment. A, fini a, a finite human being trying to overcome the infinite. You know, the lesser cannot uh, be uh, more than the greater, or uh, what uh, we say that uh, the weaker cannot defeat the stronger. So you are talking here about mortal finite man dealing with infinite immortal things how will I be able to get eternal life? And so for all have fallen the short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So it is only in Christ that the glory of God, which humanity have fallen short of, they are redeemed. They are redeemed again to bear that glory. And in verse 25, we are told Romans 3, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, an atonement, a go-between through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So God has provided a remedy for those who will enter into eternal life. And that remedy is a propitiation in his blood. That is the life of Jesus Christ to declare righteousness of the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So God continues to forbear with man through the blood of Jesus Christ per advent that he may be able to redeem, not by his own righteousness, but the righteousness of God himself, which is gotten through faith in Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3 verses 9. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Who, how can I be saved? That was the question. And then Christ says, none is good but God. And for you to have eternal life, you have to be like God. And then the righteousness that is needed is not the righteousness of you, but the righteousness of God himself. And that is the issue, the great issue that we are dealing with. How will man be saved? In uh, Psalms, Psalms chapter 32, verses, uh, uh, Psalms 32, verses 1 and 2, 5, 8, and 11, uh, this is um, what um, we read. This is um, what we read, and uh, allow me to share this. We are told, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. I acknowledge my sin, verses 5, Unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Verse 6, for this shall they, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. 
Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place, thou shalt preserve me from trouble, thou shalt compass me about with the songs of deliverance. I'll instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I'll guide thee with mine eye. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice ye righteous and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. And so the psalmist tells us this process of uh, having eternal life. It is those whose transgressions have been covered, have been forgiven. Those whom God have imputed his righteousness and not and uh, not imputed their iniquity. And we understand that imputed righteousness is simply justification by faith, where God declares a sinner righteous before he does anything and looks at him as if he have never sinned. And so the psalmist understands the thing that it is only imputed righteousness that somebody is declared good. For you cannot work your salvation and then present your works in heaven as a means of you getting into heaven. And so as God justifies you through the blood of his son, he takes care of the future sin in which way? By imparting righteousness. After he has forgiven you his sin and declared you, pardoned you, forgiven you and declared you righteousness, the only way he takes care of any future eventualities is to impart his righteousness. In that he says in Psalms, Psalms chapter 32 or the division of Psalms 32, where he imputes righteousness, he takes care of the future. In which way, verses 7 of Psalms 32, uh, we, uh, verses 8, I mean, he takes care of the future. In which way, I'll instruct thee and take thee in the way thou shalt go. I'll guide thee with mine eye. Be glad, verse 11, in the Lord and rejoice ye righteous and shout for joy all ye that are upright in heart. And so the justification by faith, which is simply pardon, which is simply declaration of righteousness, once he does that, he takes care of the future by imparting his divine nature. That is giving you his Holy Spirit. And we are told that it's not your spirit that is going to heaven. It is the spirit of Christ. In which way his mind his blood, his life, his atonement cleanses you of unrighteousness. That is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more will Christ, who overcame or who offered himself without support, purge your conscience from dead works by that eternal spirit? So it is all God's work throughout. Our work is to surrender because the spirit which we are sealed for redemption is not our spirit, but the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God given or shed forth through his sons, according to Acts chapter 2, verses 33, and uh, the book of Titus chapter, um, uh, Titus chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, I presume. And so uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we are told that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that seek, that diligently seek him. And how do we seek him diligently? In uh, Philippians, and uh, I don't want to misquote this, in Philippians chapter 2, uh, we are told in uh, verses uh, 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In which way? For it is God, verse 13, which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So you are seeing this process of getting eternal life. And um, again, another good verse is uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses uh, uh, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you 
will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The biggest problem then has been people surrendering. People coming out of wishing to be Christians, to being Christian, by continual beholding of Jesus Christ and being turned into the self-same image. You get the other statements that um, are, it is not the hearers of the law, but the doers of the law who are justified. Now, why is it that the, it brings about the issue of the doers of the law? Still, it is Christ who doeth these things. Christ says, if you don't believe me, then believe in the works, because it is the Father in me who performs this work. And that is why we are told that you cannot say that you have been justified, you have been forgiven, and then just remain in your sinful life. Then that is not forgiveness. You know, we handle this issue of salvation as if it's a court case. And what do I mean by a court case? You do something wrong, and then you go to the court of law. You meet a judge, and you have the best lawyers around. Some of them are corrupt. Some of them understand the law very well and how to sway things. And he appears before the judge. And uh, he defends your case so well. And then the judge says, you know what? It was reported that you were a thief. But now I declare you free. Go home. Now, that is what the judge has done. But uh, apart from that, there is nothing the legal system have done to you. And uh, that is how we view salvation also. We go to Jesus Christ and say, or we go to God and say, God, you know, I have done this and this. And then Christ stands there and say, you know, Father, this is my child. And then the father said, through my son, I forgive you. But Christ doesn't deal with this issue as even the legal courts deal with it. The forgiveness itself, we are told, is unmerited favor. It gives grace, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. You are saved through grace that no one should boast about it. And so what Christ does he says, okay, you have professed my name. I have sought you and I have found you. And you have accepted this free gift of justification by faith. What must I do to get eternal life? Believe in him. Do good, but goodness cannot be done by man. And so Christ sees you are imperfectness and impossibility of uh, you who is finite approaching infinite things. And then he says, you know what? I myself am infinite. And what I'll do, I'll provide a remedy to what you are going through. I give you my life, which is eternal. He is different from the judge of the world because the judge of the world just pronounced a legal possession of things. But here Christ, he says he gives you the grace. The grace to do what? To be able now to face the future triumphantly. His own grace, his own spirit. So when we continue in sin after being told that we have been justified, then it means we never received that justification because that justification comes with grace. And grace is enabling uh, our power. First of all, grace is unmerited favor on the part of justification. That is forgiveness and pardon. That is unmerited favor. You haven't done anything that uh, really will uh, uh, sway God or um, convince God that uh, you are worthy of eternal life. There is nothing you have done. But he looks you through the lenses of his son and he says, oh, you have accepted him as uh, your brother. Then I have no problem with that. But that is not the place that God lives. He says, now, because you are a son through my son, Galatians 4, 6, I give you the spirit of my son. Because my son is righteous, only what I need is righteous sons. I came for those who are not my sons to be my sons. 
And uh, how does a person become a son in a family? In a, in a, in a, in a natural way, there is the partaking of the DNA of the father and uh, the traits and the character. And then at the end, you partake of the inheritance because you have the DNA of the person who have the wealth. Now, we partake of eternal life, which is an inheritance, but we are not sons of God naturally. So that son of God naturally, who is Jesus Christ, adopts us into that family. And then, you know, we have to be found with the DNA of the father so that to have that inheritance. And what is the DNA of the father that we partake of? I can say that um, this is uh, the spirit of God. And where do I get that uh, for us to get redemption, we must partake of something that belongs to God for us to be sons and then be admitted into the kingdom. The book of uh, Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians chapter one, verse 13. That is the verse I want, but I'll start as earlier as um, verses eight. Wherein, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 8, wherein he hath abound, abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So the Father is gathering everything unto himself, but through his Son. Verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Through the Son we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Verses 12 of Ephesians chapter 1, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after they that ye believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And so we find that uh, for us to be part of this um, uh, heirs of the kingdom, as the natural child have the DNA of the father, so the adopted son must get into possession with that thing that belongs to the father, which is the spirit. And there's no one in this world that can say, I have done this good one. Now give me your spirit, which is an, uh, 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 a promise of inheritance. No, the spirit is given freely to those who believe in Jesus Christ. John chapter one, verses um, uh, 12, we are told that uh, for those who accepted him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verses um, uh, 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So without this spirit, we are finding that we will never get to heaven. And how do we come into possession of this spirit? Because the ruler asked, Master, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? He was told, only God is good. And you go and do the commandments and you will have eternal life. But there is none amongst us who can reproduce the goodness of God without partaking of his goodness, by the way. It is only by partaking of his goodness that is when we can reproduce his goodness. And that goodness is the possession of the Holy Spirit. And so, um, while some are looking at themselves, there's something so important we are told. This issue of looking at self, it will never reproduce something that is good unto God. We can examine ourselves and examine ourselves day and night. But... Uh, as we continue examining ourselves, only what we will find in ourselves is imperfection at every step that we make. But then we are told, behold the man. Or as John 1.29 says, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. 
as long as we continue looking unto us and what we can do and what we can uh, present before the Father for eternal life, only what we will meet is failure. So uh, I, I love this statement and uh, I'd like to share with us very sublime statement and um, it is coming from uh, uh, letter 46, 1879, paragraph six. Now, we are told all oh, that uh, all oh, the Christian's last days may be fragrant because the beams of the sun of righteousness shine through the light, diffusing a perpetual fragrance. Oh, what reason have we for joy that our Redeemer poured out his precious blood on the cross and at, as an atonement for sin? And by his obedience to death brought in everlasting righteousness. You know that today he is at the Father's right hand, a prince of life, a savior. There is no other name wherein you can trust your eternal interest. What can he do to have eternal life? But in Christ you may rely fully, implicitly. Christ has been loved by you, although your faith has sometimes been feeble and your prospects confused, but Jesus is your savior. He does not save you because you are perfect, but because you need him and in your imperfection have trusted in him. Jesus loves you, my precious child. And so in Luke chapter 17, verse 10, we are told, so likewise, when you shall have done all these things which are commanded you, we are, which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Now, so what must you do to get eternal life? Only God is good. But you go do the commandments and you will have eternal life. You see how Jesus Christ answers this man. Simply, you want to get perfection by the law. Go try do it and see if you get eternal life. It is only in that one who is good that only good can be reproduced. And so even after he tells him, go do the commandments, in Luke 17, we are, he tells us that even after you have done which you have been commanded to do, what you have to say, I am unprofitable servant. I have just done which was my duty to do. But that duty does not warrant me salvation. And so in MS 48, 1891, paragraph 52, we are told, it is not your spirit that is going into heaven. It is Christ's spirit. Will you have it? Think about that. What shall I do to get eternal life? It is not your spirit that is going into heaven. It is Christ's spirit. And then you are asked, will you have it? Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and will sup, sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20. Then I ask, how is it that so many of you are saying you do not know whether you are accepted of God or not, that you want to find Jesus? Don't you know whether you have opened the door? Don't you know whether you have invited him in? If you have not, invite him now. Don't wait a moment. Open the door and let Jesus in. That is what we are told we should be doing. Rather than... Uh, Worrying ourselves with the, the things we will never be able to accomplish. We are to implicitly give our lives to Jesus Christ. And then in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, we are told that, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of us, or none of his, I mean. Know ye not that ye are, you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwelleth in you. And then uh, if the spirit of God dwelleth in you, then it will reproduce the righteousness, the goodness that is of God. And it is through this eternal spirit that you will go to heaven. And that brings us to the title of the presentation, The Gift of Salvation. Salvation is a gift that cannot be bought because salvation is made sure by the spirit of God, which cannot be bought at any price. And so the Holy Spirit is always working on human hearts and everyone has to take in to get regeneration and to be a new man. 
this all nature that was pulled to the other direction has to be pulled to uh, uh, the direction of Jesus Christ. And so the converted soul will live to, for Christ because it is no longer he that liveth, but Christ liveth in him by his spirit. And so the gospel of Christ, when taken by faith, will become a personality in those who believe, whose personality, the personality of Jesus Christ. When Christ is taken in by faith, Christ in you, the hope of glory, then you have the identity of Jesus Christ. You have the divine nature. And then you take the helmet or the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Which means when you are in possession of the Holy Spirit, when you are possessed by the Holy Spirit, it is sharp point will be the word of God and nothing else. There's no way the spirit works without the, uh, uh, the power of uh, the word or uh, there's no way the Holy Spirit works without the word, which is it is vehicle, according to Ephesians chapter, um, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 17. And so God is willing that uh, we may have his righteousness in us. And so how are we going to be presented before him? I want you to see this. How are we going to attain all that uh, he needs? Uh, not by painful struggles or wearisome toil, not by gift or sacrifice is righteousness obtained, but it is freely given to every soul who hungers and thirsts to receive it. For everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no man, come ye by and eat, without money and without price. Their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord, and this is his name, whereby he shall be, uh, be called the Lord our righteousness, Isaiah chapter 55. So all the righteousness that uh, will be accepted in heaven, the saints will say, the Lord, our righteousness. This is the gift of salvation. And then in MS 40, 1894, paragraph 12, look at this. But that which God required of Adam in paradise before the fall, he requires in this age of the world from those who will follow him. Perfect, obedient to his law. But righteousness without a blemish can only be obtained through the imputed righteousness of Christ, not imparted righteousness. And so righteousness without blemish is that pardon, it's that justification that is declared. We may have this imparted righteousness where the spirit help us to overcome every evil tendency cultivated and inherited. But at the end of the day, even our motives may be not be the right motive. So only the righteousness accepted before God is um, uh, 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 this uh, 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 righteousness imputed. And uh, this is the only righteousness that the Lord is expecting uh, for from the saints. And so what can we to do today? What we can do is accept the free gift that uh, we have been given by Christ. It is to accept uh, this uh, free gift that we have been given in Christ. And uh, I know that the Lord is willing to save us. The Lord is willing to save us. And uh, what we have to do is surrender our hearts so that uh, he may work out his own will in us. And uh, he says that whoever feeds on my flesh and my blood, in him, the, uh, in his belly shall fall, flow forth the rivers of life. And so let us look unto Jesus Christ. And as we look unto him, we shall be changed from glory to glory. And uh, may the Lord bless us. and. Let us not give up. Christ is on our side. The angels are on our side. The Father is on our side. And the Spirit is on our side.
What they want is to accomplish their perfect will in us. As man was created in the likeness of God, nothing less will satisfy God than his own likeness. And when God created man, he was dust. It was only after he breathed in him that he became a living soul. And that is exactly what he will do with us. He will breathe his life in us once again. He will give us this new heart. He will sprinkle on us the clean water. He will um, uh, renew our heart. In fact, David says, take not away uh, uh, thy spirit from me. Renew the gift of salvation in me. And what is this renewal of the gift of salvation? It is giving you a new heart. It is giving you his spirit so that uh, you may be able to walk in his ways. And so we thank the Lord that he has provided everything that we need for our eternal life. And like the ruler, we ask ourselves, what must I do to get eternal life? We are told today, believe in Christ. If you believe in him, then he will come and serve with you. He will give you his spirit. The father will give you his spirit through his son. And then you will be able, not your spirit going to heaven, but the spirit of Christ be admitted at the gates of heaven. Shall we pray? Heavenly father, thank you once again that uh, it is not by struggles. It is not by all this toil that we are accepted before thee, but we are accepted before thee in thy son. Help us to be able to grasp this sublime truth and walk by faith and not by sight. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.